This is the Multi-Faith Matters Podcast. I'm your host, John Moria. Uh, welcome to the podcast for Multi-Faith Matters. I'm your host, John Moorhead, and we hope you enjoy today's podcast as always. Whether you are listening to it in audio form or watching on video via, video, uh, via our YouTube page, and of course, this is not the only resource we have. We have lots of other podcasts with guests and to- uh, topics of conversation. We have uh, recommended articles and books and consulting services and all kinds of things, and all of this is designed to help Christians not only be concerned about fulfilling the Great Commission to share our faith with others, but also the Great Commandments of loving God and loving our neighbors, and in this context, loving our multi-faith neighbors. So we have conversations uh, between people of different religious traditions to help us understand it. We also talk about religion and popular culture and what's going on in America's changing religious landscape. And uh, that's what we're going to be doing today. And as we talk about the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, those people who uh, say they have no religious affiliation in uh, various surveys like that from Pew. My guest is Eliz- Elizabeth Drescher, and I'm going to read a bit of her bio uh, so that we can get to know her. Elizabeth Drescher's research, teaching, and writing focuses on religion, spiritual, and non-religion as it is practiced by ordinary people in the context of everyday life. She holds a PhD in Christian spirituality from the Graduate Theological Union and an MA in Roman Catholic Systematic Theology from, uh, golly, I should have read this, Duchesne, help me with that. Duchesne. Very good. Thank you. University. (laughs) Dr. Drescher is the author of Choosing Our Religion, the Spiritual Lives of America's Nuns, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Tweet If You Heart Jesus, Practicing Church in the Digital Reformation and co-author with Keith Anderson of Click to Save, the Digital Ministry Bible, and Click to Save uh, Reboot. In addition to academic essays and book chapters on lived religion in America, she has published popular articles on American religious and spiritual life, new media and religion, and the challenges of religious leadership in America. The Atlantic Wire, Alternet, The Washington Post, The San Francisco Chronicle, The San Jose Mercury News, Religion Dispatches, Christianity Today, Sojourners and other national publications. From 2012 to 2014, she was a journalism fellow on the Social Science Research Council's New Directions in the Study of Prayer Initiative and has received funding from the Wabash Center, the Teagle Foundation, the Lilly Endowment, and other organizations for research, teaching, and writing on contemporary religious and spiritual life. Elizabeth, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for your work. I've enjoyed uh, a lot of your articles that I've seen online, uh, particularly Religion Dispatches, as you uh, unpacked the nuns and your book, Choosing Our Religion. Um, For me, as a scholar, uh, also trying to work with practitioners, trying to understand America's changing religious landscape, I find this a fascinating and challenging time to be studying Mm -hmm. uh, how America is changing. And I'm sure you join me in that. As we talk about the nuns, um, what are we talking about? How are they defined? Well, you know, the term nun is really a sociological term. It doesn't specifically apply to religion, although that's become its popular culture use um, in the last decade as um, more research came out on people who were asked with what religious group they identify or prefer or are affiliated And they had the whole list of Christian denominations and um, other religious groups and no religion. And so those who said none, I I don't affiliate with any religion, I don't uh, prefer any religion, um, came to be identified as nuns. So it's really a a, conventionally in academic terms, it's really kind of a remainder group. Um, Does the the question itself, the way it's framed, does that still kind of reflect our our biases and assumptions about uh, Christianity and religion being about belief and those kinds of things? Well, um, it can. Um, You know, a lot of the research that um, Pew has done, um, and they've started to shift this um, in the last five or six years, um, but really focused on belief issues. So do you believe in 
um, God or a higher power or cosmic life force. And even those terms have shift, shifted over time. Gallup, which tends to be on the more conservative end of the spectrum, asks, do you believe in God or not? Um, so they have only recently started moving into higher power and then Pew's moved into life force. The general social survey, which is the um, federal government survey of um, social and cultural uh, factors in the United States that the University of Chicago administers um, asks about um, religious affiliation. So are you affiliated with a particular institutional um, religious group or do you have a preference, uh, a religious preference? And uh, they ask about attendance at worship service. So it really varies by group. But yes, for a really long time, the focus has been on um, belief um, fairly narrowly and certain kinds of practice like attending worship service, studying scripture, um, praying, um, and other kinds of practices that may not encompass all of the things that people do within the context of what they would think of as their spiritual lives. They're a sizable group and they've been growing for a while. What, what kind of numbers are we talking about and how does it compare, for example, to other religious groups in America? Well, um, nuns are now, if they were, um, uh, and they're by no, they know me, by no means are, but if they were one um, religious denomination um, or group, they'd, they'd be um, among the largest. Um, they make up about um, 25, 26 to 30 percent of the population, depending on the survey you're looking at overall, and um, generally of greatest anxiety to people in religious groups, Christian and otherwise, among um, adults age 18 to 34, they, they make upwards of 40% um, of the population. So it's, it's a pretty dramatic um, increase since, uh, you know, in the, in the last, say, 10 years, um, you know, um, I think Pew um, found in 2007 that about 15%, 15 or 16% of the population identified as nuns. Um, that was a big uptick from the 1990s when um, it was generally nine, uh, never into the double digits. So um, over the last 20 to 30 years, um, we've seen really rapid growth among the religiously unaffiliated um, or the non-religious, the nuns, um, especially among younger people. Now, out of all the things you could have studied as a scholar in the area of religion, what is it that drew you to the nuns? I mean, I, I've always found so-called marginalized religious expressions more interesting than, than the mainstream. It helps me being a part of the mainstream, helps keep me mm -hmm. honest, but what is it that drew you to study the nuns? Um, you know, um, being an academic is a second career for me. I came okay. into academia from the corporate world. And, um, you know, uh, that's sort of a long story transition. But one of the questions that drew me into the study of religion in my own life and in general was, um, a, you know, an interest in how ordinary people um, coped with the, the um, moral and spiritual challenges in their everyday lives. And so I've always really been interested in how are people doing this? And I, I knew just from my um, experience in, um, in the corporate world that there were lots of those, um, both feelings of being morally compromised and feelings of, of the work that I and colleagues were doing, not having a sense of, of meaning and purpose in the way that we might have liked. And so when I started um, studying um, religion and theology, I was interested in how people um, did that with um, religious within religious traditions, but also outside of it and um, increasingly um, at the intersection of institutional and extra institutional or non-institutional um, religion and spirituality. I, I've just always been really interested in how um, people like you and me, ordinary people um, make their lives work. Um, and so that was really my, my interest. Um, yeah, well, um, what kind of methodology did you use in, in this study? 
Um, I used mi a mixed methodology. Um, so I um, began by um, analyzing the available data from um, Pew and the General Social Survey and other sources like that to look at patterns. Um, in, in the religious landscape and how they were changing. I also did um, focus groups and surveys um, with um, relatively diverse um, national cohorts of, of people um, in different parts of the country in terms of, of focus groups. So I was getting the East Coast and the West Coast, liberal areas uh, you know, on both coasts and, and in the Midwest and in the, in the traditional Bible Belt in focus groups and then I did a broad um, survey of people um, to understand what they consider to be spiritually meaningful practices. And based on that, I, I developed um, a pool of people from whom I drew um, a little more than a hundred um, people that I interviewed across the country, literally from Maine to Maui. Um, you know, I visited every census um, um, region in the United States to get a representative um, sample of people um, who had participated in the surveys I had done or been referred to me through that work. Um, so I was trying to get a lot of different layers. Uh, this question is probably going to be very complex, unlike what I see a lot of times in media reporting, the assumptions are that the nuns largely represent an uptick in the number of atheists. So people were just rejecting religion and spirituality altogether. But who are the nuns and what is the relationship between, there has been some increase in people who would claim to be atheists and agnostic, but is that the major story or who are they? What's the diversity that makes up the nuns? Yeah, I mean, you know, probably um, about, um, and it's increased, you know, about um, four or 5% of people in the United States, according to Pew, identify formally as atheist or agnostic. Now, for a long time, um, Pew didn't distinguish that category, so you couldn't really those those two categories. Um, you know, we know that within the ag agnostic group, there are some folks who are hard agnostics. They're kind of pretty much atheists, but they're hedging their bets um, and kind of keeping the question open. And there are other people who are agnostic but they're genuinely curious. So there's some flexibility um, within those groups, but generally that's about four or five uh, percent of the population. That's doubled over the last uh, 30 years or so. So there's been a sizable growth in that. But the bulk of, of the people who identify as non-religious or, or nuns, um, about 15, between 15 and 20%, depending on the data set, um, identify as nothing in particular or having no preference. So it doesn't mean that, and they have a, a range of, they, they do a range of practices that look pretty religious-y to those of us who are familiar with those. And they may espouse beliefs that sound um, pretty religiously and often you know, pretty specifically Christian, even if they don't define them in that way. Um, so within that broader category um, of the, the 15 to 20% or so of, of nuns who identify as nothing in particular, it really is a, um, um, you know, just a, a, a smorgasbord um, of, if we can imagine a time when we actually weren't frightened by smorgasbords, but, um, you know, of, of approaches to religiosity and spirituality. Is it uh, fair to say that the nuns can be understood as those who are, who are dissatisfied with institutional forms of religiosity and identifying with that, and they're instead seeking more of an individual questing, seeking kind of orientation? Not so much. Okay. Um, I would say not so much. So um, lots of people are, are probably familiar with Robert Bella's work, which identified this character, Sheila, um, who was a nurse who, who said she had kind of created her own religion and Bella and colleagues, um, you know, coined this phrase Sheilaism as this kind of individualistic, personal, fairly narcissistic, um, self-referential um, kind of boutique spirituality. Um, even with Sheila, that character, Sheila was a nurse. She helped people, that was her, her day job. Um, and a lot of the work that she did spiritually was 
um, arguably to um, sustain her in being able to do that care work. So it was actually less individualistic and narcissistic um, than Bella and colleagues identified. And I found among the people that, that um, I interviewed and surveyed um, that um, some of them were um, alienated from institutional religion. Some of them had never really been a part of institutional um, religions. Um, and some of them had continuing relationships with institutional religions. They just didn't um, affix a personal identity um, in relation to them in the way that I might say I'm an Episcopalian or you, you, know, you might say I'm a, an evangelical. Um, they, they just didn't do that. Um, what I, I found um, overall was that relationships, um, personal relationships with family, friends, and community often defined um, the spiritual practices of the religiously unaffiliated. And so they, they often can appear um, individualistic um, because people articulate them in very personal terms. But when I ask people to do, really talk about the things that they do um, to um, cultivate or nurture um, their spirituality, however they define that, um, and that's a range as well. Um, they talked about doing things either personally in order to enable them to better be in relationship with others or through relationships in order to um, nurture their own um, spiritual well-being. You, you touched on it a little bit in that response there, but maybe you could flesh it out a little bit. What kinds of journeys are people taking that lead them to become nuns? Are there any, any common factors or is there a lot of diversity there? There is. And, and, and I should say, you know, um, I published um, uh, choosing our religion in 2016 and was doing that research for about five years before that. So we're 10 years out from that data pool. And, um, and, and when I look now, for example, at my undergraduate students um, at Santa Clara University, they're very different people than the people that I interviewed. The people that I interviewed um, are their parents or elder siblings. Um, so um, we've seen some shifts over time. And so the journeys that people are on um, depend on the starting place. Um, when the, the early um, US religious landscape um, and, Pew, um, and Pew reporting came out in about 2007, 2008, that showed this big uptick in the non-religious, um, in the nuns, the bulk of that population were people who had been in a religious community uh, or had been raised in one, at least nominally, generally um, Christianity, and they had left that. Um, and so both the kind of um, religious community they were in and the circumstances of their leaving shaped how they um, came to identify as nuns. And so I saw among the population um, that I identified, the majority of whom were, had come from Christian um, backgrounds, that um, you know, people who came from mainline Protestant um, backgrounds that tended to be more um, progressive, um, both in their theologies and in their social practices, um, often um, didn't have a lot of you know, um, angst or um, hostility about the religion. They just kind of got it. They were bored with it. They'd been there, did that, love your neighbor, I'm good. I, you know, I can go. So I, I you know, I saw, you know, the people I talked to, um, or who talked to me actually, you know, telling stories about, you know, like I, I loved youth group. Um, I had fun in um, the, the choir or, or whatever, but then I, I just didn't need to do it anymore. I grew up out of it. Um, so that was a pretty common pattern among um, Catholics um, who participated in my study. There was a lot of hurt. Um, they actually felt more um, pushed out of the tradition than having left it, whether 
um, that happened because of um, perceived um, sexism, um, lack of opportunities for women in religious leadership. Um, you know, the clergy abuse crisis, of course, had, as I was doing the research, really come into the, the, the public realm. And although none of the people that I interviewed had been um, directly personally impacted by that, they were aware of it and they were scandalized by that, or they had, um, um, you know, different um, um, perspectives on social issues um, than the Catholic Church. Um, largely, they were failures of community. They just didn't feel like the structure supported um, them. So there was a lot of, you know, I, I talk in choosing our, our religion about, you know, mainline Protestants having been bored out of their churches, um, you know, um, Catholics having been kind of hurt, uh, wounded out of their, their churches. And um, among evangelical um, Protestants, there was a, they were the most angry group. Um, the active cussers in my interviews were almost all <laughs> evangelical Protestants or Mormons who felt like their traditions had lied to them about mm. uh, facts in the world, about science, um, about evolution, about um, social issues, um, and uh, just a range of things that they felt like they were being told untruths um, and that there were failures in, in leadership. So they tended to be the angriest group. They felt, um, um, they often felt like they came from churches that professed really strong values and truth and honesty were among that. And they saw a lot of hypocrisy in leadership, but also untruth in their representations of the realities in, in the world. Um, so there were, you know, kind of a range, everybody didn't, you know, there was some overlap in that, of course, that's not a, a hard and fast um, typology. Um, I just wanna point out though, now um, among, and I'm just gearing up in the next year to do another study related um, to this, um, among my undergraduates who are between 18 and 22 generally, um, I'm seeing, first of all, far more of them who have come from families that were non-religious. Religious. So their starting point is not a religious tradition that they have left, okay. um, but just having never had that as an important uh, phenomenon, they may be um, even second generation non-religious where um, I'm, I've noted um, I survey my students every quarter just to know them um, in religious terms. But as I track on that, I'm starting to see um, students who talk about having had grandparents where one of the grandparents uh, was very religious and one not or some combination of that. And then the parents are less religious and then not religious and they are not religious at all. And so what I'm seeing among young adults today and in mind, I teach in a, in a religiously affiliated university. I teach in a Catholic university. So, um, you know, but I've seen that when I started teaching there 11 years ago, um, about 80% of my students identified as religiously affiliated, mostly Catholic, but a lot of Protestant. Um, now that's down to about 40% um, in, in my, in religion classes. So, um, the idea of a journey, the kind of Robert Fuller seeking um, person that was characteristic of the boomers sort of coming out of the 1960s and 70s um, is I think less typical of the unaffiliated today than it would have been a generation ago or two. Interesting. Uh, the audience for this podcast is probably largely conservative evangelical. My hope is that we can be self-critical and open to the, the kinds of journeys that are taking place and the perceptions that these folks have of our church culture and church community. Um, a follow-up to that, uh, they said that they, if I understand it correctly, they said that the, that the evangelical church was portrayed as a community where one could seek out truth and this kind of thing, and yet they weren't finding that. Would you say that the perception, or maybe you did some follow-up research in this area, was the perception that there was no room to ask questions, to express doubt about what they were teaching, and they were just supposed to, here's the, the, the truths we want you to accept without question, and there was no, no room for any kind of skepticism or, or searching and that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, there was a pattern, um, first of all, of 
um, and I'm thinking of in particular one person I identified who was a really bright um, young man who had, um, you know, gotten really involved in developing um, uh, video games with um, some evangelical game developers, real sciencey kind of kid, um, had been homeschooled um, and had been, you know, taught um, that uh, had 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 been taught um, creation theory, um, you know, and um, and been taught, you know, that evolutionary theory was was um, you know entirely false, and um, you know comes to find out when he uh, leaves home to go to college that there are other views on that story, mm -hmm. um, and so he felt. Um, not just that he couldn't question the truths that were presented to him, um, that was certainly true, but also that what he what was presented as true was false when he was able to, to see other evidence. And so there were kind of two layers and he was probably the most extreme in this viewpoint, but I, I, saw, I did see it generally across um, evangelicals and people who came from the LDS um, tradition, the sort of sense of there are, there are unalloyed truths and we, we don't question or challenge them. And when those fall apart, the level of betrayal um, on that is profound. Um, it's, it's profound in that people feel um, both that there's not space to explore, and I know this varies across evangelical traditions, um, but there was not space to explore those questions um, and or that questions came with, you know, elaborate apologetics responses mm -hmm. that really didn't, um, weren't evidence-based in the sense that we would, would use in a scientific um, assessment today. So there's a sense of just, I didn't get that, you know, people lied to me. I mean, I heard that a lot. They lied to me and they were hypocritical um, about it. So there, there was just sort of this um, sense of not being able to trust um, the adults in your life um, who are really bringing you into a relationship um, with a community, with a set of values and um, that connects to the, the, the being that you consider to be divine. And so that really, for a lot of, of evangelical Protestants um, who talked with me, that really um, was an almost um, um, a, an unrepairable breach in, in trust um, that not only um, damaged um, you know, uh, their relationship with their faith tradition, but with their families and friends and communities. So it was a more pervasive sense than that. Um, there's another researcher, uh, Josh Packard, who's at, I wanna say the University of Northern California or Northern Colorado, rather, um, who, who, you know, has identified this group of, of people he calls duns, Dun, yeah. who are people who, who have been wounded by the church. He, I think he did a follow-up book called Church Refugees who sees people, um, sees a subset of the nuns in, in um, evangelical um, Protestant traditions who are, um, you know, disappointed with their churches, but not lost to the tradition. The people mm -hmm. who talked to me tended to be not, a, they were done, but they were just done with a capital done. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's very interesting, especially your, your mention of not only evangelicals, but Mormons. I've been involved in Mormon evangelical dialogue and Mormon studies, and it would seem that both traditions want to proselytize each other. They both critique each other's understanding of history and science, and yet they both have folks who are within those traditions who have left because of what they see as, as problems and shortcomings in those areas. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic how they kind of... Uh, mirror each other in that regard. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned earlier the four F's of contemporary spirituality that you have in your book. What kinds of practices are the nuns uh, finding meaning in as they orient their lives? Yeah, so um, in the, the early survey um, that I, I did, 
um, you know, I asked people, I had done a bunch of focus groups to, to identify things that people found spiritually meaningful. And then I, I did some early surveying to kind of call that down. And, uh, and then I tested um, a broader survey um, that, um, you know, was a national survey um, that went out to people to ask them to rank the things that they found um, spiritually meaningful. And what was really um, interesting for me about the results about that, of that survey was that um, the survey went out to um, a wide range of people who were religiously affiliated and unaffiliated. Um, so um, at the time, um, about 20% of the population identified, identified as nuns, and that's about the size in my study who were, uh, in my survey who were nuns. And among both groups, the religiously affiliated and the religiously unaffiliated, when I asked them to identify the things that they found most spiritually significant or meaningful or fulfilling in their lives, um, they said um, um, spending time with family, spending time with friends, uh, um, uh, preparing and sharing food and spending time with pets and other animals. So I identified those as the four Fs, um, family, friends, food, and Fido. Um, and we, what was interesting about them was that was the top of the list for both groups um, because the religiously affiliated um, uh, tend to be more often to be married and to have kids. They tended to like time with their pets a little more than time with their family. Um, but, um, and the unaffiliated spent more time with their friends than with their family. Um, but they were still at the top. And the only conventional religious practice that was in the top 10 was prayer, which is of course the, you know, the kind of mobile technology of religion. You can do it anywhere, you can do it alone, you can do it with others, and um, you don't have to follow a formula um, for it. Um, so the, the other things that had been the conventional measures that researchers had studied um, you know, belief in, in God or a higher power, or cosmic for, um, force, um, attending worship, studying scripture, um, you know, taking adult, adult education classes, uh, you know, and church ed classes, things like that, that were at the bottom of the list for both groups. Um, you know, that they were the, they were, even when people talked about things in a worship service that they found meaningful or fulfilling, whether it was, you know, uh, sacramental parts of it or music or things like that, the worship services, um, the, the more institutionalized practices were at the bottom of the list in terms of what felt um, spiritually fulfilling or meaningful for people. One of the stereotypes that I think evangelicals have is that unless you believe in God and things like the Ten Commandments and you're not an ethical person, you can't have an ethical life. And yet the, the nuns are, are living out their own set of ethics. What kinds of sources are they tapping into as they construct their ethical lives? Well, certainly, um, you know, I talk about it in the book. There are a lot of, of specific, um, you know, popular culture, uh, culture, Oprah-y um, sources that people rely on. But more generally, I saw people uh, tapping into what ethic ethicists would call a, uh, an ethics of care, um, a, an understanding of a framework for moral action that emerges from, and this is through the work of, of people like uh, Virginia Held and, and Nell Noddings and Carol Gilligan, um, that emerges from primary relationships. Um, they would have said the mother and child relationship is the template for this, um, but it goes broader than that. Um, you know, primary relationships with family members, um, friend, close friends, community members that, that teach us how to care for one another, not in an abstract sense of having particular virtues, but of actually doing the labor of caring for people. So um, being compassionate, being empathetic, um, being generous, being self-sacrificing, um, um, making efforts um, toward both self-care and care of others, um, you know, sufficient self-care that we are able to care for others um, so that we have healthy, 
um, families and friendship relationships and communities. And so among the nuns um, that I interviewed, while they never said, I have an ethic of care, um, they, they talked a lot, often through the lens of the golden rule, um, but about practices of care for others as central to their um, moral foundation and their moral practices in the world. And that's very different than an ethics that's grounded in certain um, uh, religious rules like the Ten Commandments or religious virtues um, versus vices as in virtue ethics that are a big part of the Catholic tradition. Um, it really is a more organic, we learn how to be good people by caring for the people around us. Um, so that was, I think, the pervasive um, ethical framework for the non-religious. One, one of the things that uh, has been interesting and challenging for me in watching the nuns has been the response of conservative Christian pastors and congregations. I've seen some articles kind of downplaying the significance and saying, well, we don't really need to worry about it. These were the these were nominal believers anyway. They didn't have much grounding. And so now the only ones that are left are the deeply committed or, you know, we just need to design another evangelism program or the right worship service or what have you. Do you have a feel in your research for how, how well conservative Christian congregations understand this phenomenon and whether or not they're really are equipped to address? I, I see this as a, a significant change in the religious landscape that will have deep uh, ramifications for how churches uh, promote their spirituality and do community and things like that. Are, are they taking it seriously? Are they equipped for it? Um, I can't say that I've, I've studied um, evangelical or conservative congregations um, per se, um, but I can say to kind of go back to this ethics of care. When I asked non-religious people, um, what are the, the um, spiritual or moral exemplars um, that you have um, in your life? Who are the people who influence you um, and, and help you spiritually um, in history or you know, in wisdom texts or, or whatever? I was really surprised that a large proportion of the people that I inter interviewed um, pointed to the Jesus of the Gospels. Mm. I was actually kind of shocked by that. Yeah. Um, and uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan came up over and over and over. And if anywhere in the Christian tradition, there is an explicit ethic of care, it is that, right? This ethic of neighbor love um, that, that transcends, right? This is a kind of a core Jesus-y thing. Um, transcends even familial love, right? right. Um, so that kind of sense of how do we learn to care and act as a, as a practice um, in the world in terms of care. And, and this goes back to the shift that I'm seeing among my students as well. You know, we know this summer that um, the United States was, um, on, on fire around racial justice. Um, young people have been animated with concern about care for the earth. And, and um, you know, we know this has been a, a huge issue within um, evangelical Christianity, um, the idea of care for the earth. Um, and so I think that it's not so much that Christian traditions don't have practices and um, beliefs um, that can be compelling to people who are non-religious. Um, it, it's that um, they have, and not just Christians, all religions have, have tended to hold them within institutional frameworks that make the church proper, the built church, the place down the road that you go to on Sunday or Wednesday night for Bible study or whatever you do, the place where you do your spirituality, even if you pray at home or whatever else you might do. And I think part of the shift that we're seeing um, spiritually, and, and again, for the people I interviewed, that meant a lot of things. Sometimes that referred to a divine spirit or a cosmic spirit in the supernatural way that Christians would mark as God. Sometimes it meant 
the human spirit um, and how to elevate the human spirit and, it, and its connectedness. Um, but there's been, I think, a shift to um, cultivating the spirit in a way that nurtures um, personal piety or goodness, um, things that very much come out of Reformation Protestantism, um, right? To a wider systemic sense of caring for um, the goodness of the world, the well being of the world. And so I think to the extent that um, churches of any sort, religions of any sort, can tap into that. And we, we have seen this. Um, you know, we, we saw it in the civil rights movement. There are, there are um, you know, Black Lives Matter envisions itself as a spiritual movement, although there's, there's um, tension between people who understand that spirituality religiously and secularly. It still sees itself in many ways, um, and certainly Patrice Cullors has talked about this, as a movement that's grounded in um, cultivating nurturing and um, elevating the spirit um, through action in the world. So to the extent that um, religions are engaged in the world and are sites where people can prepare themselves to um, act in the world through appropriate self-care and self-transcending care for others, they have a real place in the world. And in fact, one of my concerns um, as I've, uh, you know, every time something that troubles me in the world happens, I think, oh gosh, where is the institutional structure that is going to help people to act in the world in the way that, that churches have done, despite all of their many, many faults um, for centuries, where is that inst institutional structure going to, to come from? Um, it, it doesn't function in government in that way. It doesn't function in popular culture in that way. So it seems to me that there's a robust infrastructure, um, even if it's flawed, that can connect to people's desire to do good in the world, um, to, heal, to heal the world, um, that I think the non-religious um, and, and religious nuns are interested in, can be engaged with? Are they going to identify with, you know, the church of St. What's it? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. um, but that identification is probably less important. Um, this is my theology, is less important than, than how they act in the world. Right. Well, I think that's encouraging for churches that still want to try and make an impact and listen and and have some kind of interaction with uh, these folks. Uh, last question for you is I ask you to speculate here, particularly as you're getting ready to do some new research. Wh where do you think the nuns are going? Is this going to, are they going to continue to grow? Is this going to, is this an earthquake moving through uh, the American religious landscape? What kinds of thoughts do you have about the future? Um, I, I don't know if it's an earthquake, but the plates are shifting. Um, so, um, I, I think that's true. I think that, um, you know, we've seen over the last 50 years, a, a shift in, in people's um, valuing of institutions overall. I don't think it means that, um, you know, uh, you know, that there's sort of an anarchy of, you know, people want no institutions. There's a distrust of institutions, certainly on both conservative and, and progressive uh, ends of the spectrums, but there's also new commitments to institutionalization um, in healthier ways. So I don't know what that's going to look like, um, but this thing about this, the last generation and a half of non-religious people who are who are coming out of non-religious backgrounds um, does begin to shape a different way of um, caring for others and caring for the world um, in relationship to institutions. And we, we really just don't know what that's going to look like. Um, we just don't. Um, so I wish I, I, you know, I, I would be 
at my uh, comfortable research center in Maui if, if I had the answer to that for sure. And if I find it, I'll let you know. Um, um, so you can tell people to pay me tremendous consulting fees or something like that, but I don't. Um, I think we're in this moment where the plates are shifting um, and it's probably gonna take another 20, 30, 50 years to see where it all shakes out. Yeah. I appreciate your willingness to try and speculate for me. And if you do get that research facility in Maui, if you need an associate <laughs> or even a custodian, I'd be more than happy to, to help. Yeah. You. I'm always saying to people, you know, I, I feel like um, Hawaii overall, this is, this is true, is wildly understudied. And I would be happy <laughs> to be a scholar on the ground there um, at least half of the year to make that happen. So if I, if I figure out a way, a way to fund that, I will certainly let you know. There you go. Multi-Faith Matters always needs a, a Maui office. So that is that's, that's true. Who does not? That's right. Who does not? Well, Elizabeth, uh, thank you so much again for making time for uh, coming on the podcast. Uh, folks can find your bio and uh, links to, uh, to the book we've been talking about, choosing, your, uh, choosing Our Religion, as well as the other work that you've been doing. And I look forward to following your additional research. So thank you so much for being here. Alrighty. Thank you. Have a great day. Sure. Again, this is the uh, uh, podcast for Multifaith Matters. I'm the host, John Moorhead. Uh, please uh, rate the podcast uh, wherever you listen to it. Subscribe on the YouTube page. And if you find this uh, work that we're doing, we remember we are a nonprofit. If you find it helpful, please consider uh, a one-time donation or maybe ongoing support to keep this podcast going. Thank you so much for watching and listening.